three reasons why musicians should throw their own shows. More control of the feel and intimacy of the show. Facts. I am a huge advocate of this. I say this shit all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Whenever I did my, my events, I never did them in like a show specific venue. Because it already has a tone that's set and it's hard to create an experience outside of the experience that most people are going to get when they go there. Here's the stage, here's the bar, and this is where everybody can stand. And you can't really change much about that. They don't really let you in many cases. And also, the tone is already set, right? But if you have a different... well. If you have your own venue and it's a typical show venue, at least you have more control of doing a show when you're on somebody else's show, right? Whether it's a promoter or an artist, at least you have that. But the next level, which we talked about a few uh, a few weeks ago, is having a spot that's not even necessarily a typical live event spot. They might have, you know, all the outlets and shit, like what we did eventually ATL in the school, or they might have. Uh, I think you, you said y'all did a bookstore or y'all were going to do some shit in a bookstore. Yeah, our very first show we did back in the tattoo shop. Back tattoo shop, right? So you ha- you can create all different types of vibes. It's so, so valuable. I cannot stress enough how valuable it is to do shit in non-show venues. And you make more money that way. You don't got to deal with all them other uh, overheads and things. La Russell, we just talked about La Russell, the backyard. Yeah, that shit would not be as ex- as special if it wasn't in the backyard. If that was just at some regular venue, that might have been he could have been getting the venue for free because he got some, some homies or whatever. So it's not even about the price. The same thing, even if he didn't have to pay for it, wouldn't have the same level of benefit for him on the back end if he just did it in a regular venue instead of doing that shit in his backyard. That's a part of the fucking story. Yeah. So you got to tell the story and you create the story by doing stuff in different spaces. Quick second, have you ever seen an artist catch some traction and then they start to move? The numbers start to grow. They might even go viral. But then fast forward a year from now, somehow their numbers haven't really grown that much. They dropped back close to the same monthly listeners they had before the traction and viral moment. Well, that's because you have to know how to convert those moments into careers. And we've done this again and again with not only songs, but artists. And so has J.R. McKee, who's been a part of helping artists like Lil Durk, Rod Wave, Justine Scott, and Money Long. And we just did a collab where J.R. McKee does a step-by-step breakdown of how he took Money Long from zero to millions of monthly listeners and winning a Grammy over Beyonce, Mary J. Blige, and Jasmine Sullivan. Check out this breakdown while we still have it up. You can check it out at www.brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy. Don't forget the www or it won't work. Again, that's www.brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy. Back to the video. Now, the second thing that they know is more earnings, which a, well, again, yeah, you control more of it. You make more money. You have to pay. Um, less people you don't have to pay the event space owner whatever so we get that I think the last thing is just as important as that first thing those are the ones I focus on the most more control and feel and intimacy of the show and number three is you get a new perspective on show production Facts. so much respect for it uh, you don't respect putting a show together until you put a show together hey, man. <laughs> it's different it's different. Like, you, you understand all the nuts and bolts, so you got all kind of respect for the for the team, the the anything that goes wrong. You understand it more, but also it allows you to think from a different level of creativity too. Because mm-hmm. when you understand those elements, you can think, of, oh, when this happens, I'm gonna do that. Or to typically, this is done this way. But now that I understand holistically, I actually realize I don't have to do it that way. Yeah. All right. Because this isn't gonna domino effect and. and and shut everything else down. Sometimes we don't change stuff because we think it has to be done that way or else none of the rest of this shit works. But once you understand it, it's like, oh no, yeah, I can move this and then insert something else. So that new perspective helps there. I mean, obviously when you scale up as an artist, just understanding how, how your team works, the nuts and bolts of everything, the new perspective is is huge uh, on this one. You got anything else that you want to add in terms of like throwing your own shows in terms of value? That makes it cool. That makes it more valuable. I mean, I would say whether well, control is me more is getting new self production. I mean, kind of like I was saying earlier, you get a lot more um, control over the data, right? Like you get the emails, you get the phone numbers, yes. 
you control the way you, you can interact with fans in the venue, which, I mean, most venues are typically pretty cool with letting you set certain things up, but, you know, you want that complete control, you know, your show. Um, but that one is huge to me because, like I said, that could be the difference between like, a, a hundred person show financially isn't crazy, but a hundred emails is very valuable. Right. Um, so I think, like, just being able to get access to that says a lot. And then I would say, a, a, I mean, I guess it's, it does fall within the, you know, curation of the experience, but putting y'all on the show together also makes sure that you get the most favorable light in the event. You know, because every artist is going to get booked for an event where they put you in a trash slot. Yeah. Comes with the territory, bro. So it's a growing pains. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be first. You're going to be last. Which everybody thinks going last is cool. Going last is only cool if you're the headliner. If you're not a headliner material, going last is, is a death wish. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everybody going home during your set. <laughs> everybody knows, oh, I got no time to get to the parking lot before you finish your set. <laughs> Great. This is what I'm getting out. So, you know, but you get more control over when and how. Like, I've met, I know artists... Um. When I first ever started working for that label I worked for, I remember there was this artist that we signed, and in his college days, he would, he went to college like somewhere in Boston, and he would just like book acts to come through Boston and like make himself the opener. You know what I'm saying? Um, but so he was also making money off of throwing these shows around the Boston area and using them as a way to like plug himself and plug his own music, which I always thought was genius because like, hey, bro, double dipping. You know what I'm saying? You make some money and you gonna make sure, hey, I'm going on right before this person come. On. I'm not putting random little who the fuck whatever. You can go first. You know what I'm saying? You can go last or whatever. So um, I think it's undervalued about controlling your position on the show because, like, like you, to your point, once you understand your audience and the people that's attracted to the event, you know exactly where you want to put yourself. Like, whenever we used to do Blue Summers, if there was an artist on the Blue Summer docket that we really, really fuck with, we put them, like, third or fourth because we know it's a great spot. You had enough time for all the early people to come in and get settled, and then they're a little lit and they're having fun, right? And you're not like too far out where like people are gonna leave during your set. They know it's still more to come, so they're gonna stick around for a little more versus like the first three and the last three, they got different issues. You no, know, di different sides of the same coin with basically the same issues, right? Um, but yeah, position on the show is super, super valuable. But other than that, man, I think they, they touch on touch on all the big stuff on like why you should be throwing the show. I guess the last thing I would say would be the the reason you should throw your own show is because nobody else is booking you. <laughs> you know what I'm as, as fucked up as that sounds that's the a large reason that's the reason I know why many artists are throwing their own shows it's the only reason I started throwing shows like I, I had an artist that I was managing nobody would book the motherfuckers so I started throwing my own events you know what I'm saying like I'm gonna put you on that shit right and like I said I've met there's an artist in the city named Jelani Jelani's like that Jelani told me that's how he got started doing his own show where he wanted pretty much all the things that this said like when it comes with the control but then he was like yeah man I just know it's like I want to do shows like once a month and nobody was booking me once a month. So I started throwing my own shit once a month, you know, however frequently he was doing it. So that could also be a reason you put a show together is that nobody else will book you for better or for worse. You know what I'm saying? For whatever reason is the reason people won't book you. I ain't here to talk about that. I'm just saying if it ain't happening, you can do it. Cause it's not as complicated as people think it is to throw a show. It is, it is complicated. Don't get me wrong, yeah, it's but expected. it's not as hard as people would think it is. Right. It's like a very simple show. You just need a venue, a DJ, um, you know what I'm saying, some performers and it's people to help you promote it. But uh, like that's a like it's, it's a little deeper than that, but like very surface level, that's all you need is a, a decently successful show, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um and then you can build in production value and, and, and entertainment value as things go on, but like like that formula alone I've seen artists be able to put themselves in front of their first twenty people, thirty people, fifty people crowd, you right. know what I'm saying? And then go from there. So yeah, nobody's booking you, bro. It's not some, maybe you got to prove to people why you should be booked first. Put your money up, throw a fire show, get some footage of it, like you said, and then that becomes your highlight reel. And then people will book you. You know what I'm saying? Like, my artist, when we did the Blue Summers, or not, because we haven't put on Blue Summer, but, you know, the early shows, like, that that did help. I remember sending emails with footage from the first couple shows, and like, yo, look at him. You know what I'm saying? He's a star. Don't you want to book this guy? Don't you want to throw us a bag to come out of wherever you at? <laughs> See, this is something that we did very well. I actually didn't have anything to say until you said that last thing the highlight reel for your artist mm. rich that right there is another thing you should add to this list right just all out you get highlights that you, <clears throat> excuse me you get highlights that you can you know flex about on social media mm -hmm. and help use to get yourself booked for other shows when you convince and you're like on the line because there are some people who will book you 
if you seem like you can bring a good performance. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. They don't care about crowd. They don't necessarily care about, yeah, care about you having a whole bunch of uh, like followers or, or streams and any of that stuff. Right. But and this goes, especially for people who are throwing shows, your show will go to another level if you look at everybody as your customer. Artists, this works as well, right? Because you need to look at your fans, where's your customer, then your, then your fans. Not just, ooh, how cool I look, but how can I make sure they have the best experience ever? But what we did was make sure the artists had the best experience ever, too. Like, we gave them looks and feels like they were not getting looks and feels. Like, I don't know if you remember, like, some of the, like, shots. And, like, one for Floyd. Like, bro, we got a crazy, like, photo of Floyd that I remember. Like, I still think of to this day. This nigga look lit. Like, he was, like, <laughs> the biggest artist in the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you do that kind of shit, like, people are going to want to be a part of it. And you don't have to do as much to, like, find artists and, and convincing people because they're like, dang. Like, one, it, even if this wasn't big, just to have this shit for me to market later would be great. But they also are going to start to feel like, well, this is something official. You will start getting better curated selection and everything. So, yeah, if you can think about everybody like a customer, that's the simplest way of saying it and serve them that way. But especially with the artists, yeah, like make them look as dope as possible. Because that's also going to make them feel dope. And it's going to make it, 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 it goes full circle. So, um, yeah, that highlight reel is essentially what I thought about when it was like, yeah. Help the heart, help the artists make a highlight reel for themselves. If you're more of a promoter and somebody who's trying to build from the ground up, not like the typical club shit, because you know they they got different, they got different things, different group. People. They don't, they, yeah, they don't have to think. Much, they got know? different struggles. <laughs> They're different, definitely different, different struggles. 